Greetings, this is Abu Hamar al-Masihi uh, on behalf of Truth After Knowledge. Uh, Great Millstone started their uh, so-called Passover about a week ago, and before I begin cutting into them in this video, I'd like to first say, uh, in a spirit of goodwill, that I hope they enjoyed their festivities. Okay, uh, having said that, uh, the recent passing of one of uh, another one of G uh, GMS's Passovers gives us another opportunity to discuss their twisted version of the Hebrew lunar calendar. And this is an important subject, as they still haven't got it right yet. Uh, it's our prayer that by the end of this video, others will see why we think this subject is so important. So let's begin by first noting that the Hebrew calendar provided by Great Millstone is put together by Tahar himself, as is noted in the following clip. Now, me and this brother work together to put the calendar together, together every year that you brothers go to and you find out what high holy days come in, what day and so forth, and when the new moons come in. That clip is uh, also helpful in that it provides uh, Great Millstone's calendar for 2011. But before getting into their calendar for 2011, let's go all the way back to their calendars for 2008 and 2009, as uh, that's how far their systemic errors go back. It's my intention to go through the history of Tahar's ever-changing calendar since 2008. Here you can see Great Millstone's calendars for 2008 and 2009 lined up right next to each other. Uh, there's a number of contradictions between them which were covered in some of our previous videos which I don't want to get into at this time. Uh, for now, I simply want to focus on specifically two lines, those being the ones which cover Passover and Pentecost, or uh, First Fruits, which is the other name for Pentecost. Uh, as you may recall in our video on the uh, Lunar Sabbath, uh, it was noted that back in 2008 and 2009, GMS used to hold Pentecost, or First Fruits, 50 days after the end of their Passover, at the end of their uh, Days of Unleavened Bread. Uh, you can see that here. In 2008, the uh, Feast days of Unleavened Bread ended on February 27th, and Pentecost came in 50 days later on April 18th. So too in 2009, their days of Unleavened Bread ended on March 17th, and uh, First Fruits came in 50 days later on May 7th. So keep this in mind as we go on. GMS used to have Pentecost 50 days after Passover. Now let's look at their calendar for 2010. You may notice that at the top of the screen, it states the following, quote, the Passover date has been updated, end quote. What this means is that in their original 2010 calendar, uh, they had one date for Passover, and then they changed it. The reality is that they changed the date by bumping it up a month later than the original date. So now, looking at their calendar for 2010, let's focus on specifically the lines for Passover and First Fruits. Remember how in the previous two calendars, Great Millstone started 50 days after the last day of Unleavened Bread? Well, now it's slightly over 20 days after. That's because Tahar jumped the date for Passover ahead a month, but forgot to change the date for First Fruits. And thus, with the loss of nearly 30 days, we get this totally unscriptural and unjustifiable situation where First Fruits falls a mere 22 days after the end of the Days of Unleavened Bread. Now let's switch to, 2000, uh, to Tahar's uh, 2011 calendar, that the same problem has carried over uh, where First Fruits falls just a little over 20 days after the end of the Days of Unleavened Bread. But it gets even more interesting when we compare the 2010 calendar to the 2011 calendar. Uh, you can see the calendar for 2010 in blue on the top here, and the calendar for 2011 is underneath it. Now, let's focus on specifically the dates for Passover. Note that, that the date fell back about 11 days, which is understandable when working with the lunar calendar against the solar calendar. However, now let's compare the dates of Hanukkah and Purim. Notice that those dates jumped forward about 19 days. Now, this is an utter contradiction between the two calendars, where the date for Passover is falling backwards, while the dates for Hanukkah and Purim are jumping forward, and a number of the other holidays jump forward as well. Now, the reason why this happened is because Tahar was aware of some of the contradictions in his 2010 calendar and was trying to adjust them, but he didn't get all the errors. For example, keep in mind that, that Passover is supposed, supposed to fall in the first month and Hanukkah is supposed to fall in the ninth month. That means that there should be eight new moons between Passover and Hanukkah. But if you go through the dates on the 2010 calendar, there are only six new moons between Passover and Hanukkah. This is because in 2009 and 2010, Tahar twice corrected the date of Passover without changing some of the other dates in the calendar. In other words, he jumped Passover ahead two months without ever jumping the other dates ahead those months. And thus, in, by the 2010 calendar, he had lost two months. Now, by having the date for Passover fall back 
while the date for Hanukkah jumps forward a month in the 2011 calendar, Tahar only partially corrected the problem. Go ahead and count the moons again uh, for yourself, and you'll see that there are only seven new moons between Passover and Hanukkah in the 2011 calendar, when it's supposed to have eight new moons between them. Thus, even though he made a little bit of a correction, it, the, the calendar is still contradicting the scriptures. Now, the question is, how did this happen? How could a man who claims to be a prophet and claims to be the only one with the true understanding of the scriptures commit so many basic errors? The answer to this question is something that we'll get into in a second. But in order to answer it, let's now run through a brief history of GMS's calendar. In 2008, Great Millstone started their Passover on February 20th, which struck many as bizarre. So a number of people, including people who were following them, questioned them on that. And uh, three days later, on February 23rd of 2008, Tahar attempted to give a defense of that date. As you watch this clip, note in particular the part where Tahar says that it's possible for the calendar to slide back continuously for 10 years straight. And keep that in mind. A lot of brothers have problems with the fact that we, we said that the Passover was held uh, a couple of days ago. So one guy said, I mean he wasn't saying it to be wicked, but they said, wait a minute, isn't the Passover supposed to be somewhere around March, April? Now, how many days is in a year according to the Gregorian calendar? 365. Now, the Hebrew calendar is supposed to have how many, how many days in a year? It's supposed to have about 360. It works out to about 360, not exactly 360. Right, 354, all right? So really, a year is supposed to be no more than what? Three, to round it off, 360 days. So what they're doing is they're adding five more days. Leap so years. really it's supposed to go back, go up five or six days, five days. Because if you if you if you have five more days, they're gonna go up. So really you gotta do, wait a minute, you gotta count five days back. So now what if that happens for ten years? That's 50 days you got to go backwards. So what's so hard to believe about the Passover not falling in March or April? So that was Tahar's attempt to defend the ridiculous February 20th date. The various members of uh, Truth After Knowledge back in 2008 attacked Tahar for his uh, elementary understanding of how the lunar calendar works. It was a very basic and uh, simplistic understanding. Uh, we even got back word uh, back in 2008 after we had done that we got back word that even other UPKers who were outside of GMS who had seen the drama unfold were saying behind closed doors that we quote unquote cut Tahar on that subject now because Tahar got cut so bad and because you know and perhaps attempting to avoid a similar controversy in 2009 he uh, jumped the date for Passover ahead to March 11th this contradicted his original depiction of the lunar calendar as continuously sliding backwards. So, Truth After Knowledge launched a number of new arguments against his about face, about this 180 degree turn. Now, it was then that Tahar's young followers in Texas got involved. Uh, this is the group of young men which has alternatively called itself Man Up Jacob, Man Up Yaquab, and perhaps some other names. Uh, anyway, in the video, that they made, they tried to pretend that Tahar was simply going by the metonic cycle, where the lunar calendar falls back for two or three years against the solar calendar and then has a leap year in which it jumps forward 30 days. In other words, uh, it would gain 19 days vis-a-vis uh, -vis the previous date. Now, Truth After Knowledge went on to release a uh, multiple videos exposing how naive and erroneous their attempt to cover for him, for Tahar was and the uh, young men in Texas suddenly went silent on the issue. Now, if, you, if the jump from 2008 to 2009 was allegedly a leap year, then the move from 2009 to 2010 should have been a regular year, at least if they're going on the uh, metonic cycle. Now, in, in other words, from 2009 to 2010, the date should have slid back. But Tahar knew that if he let the date slide back in 2010, it would again wind up in February. So, attempting to avoid that and contradicting the bluffs of his followers in Texas, Tahar jumped the date of Passover ahead again for the second year in a row. Now, for the men in Manab Jacob, who, or Manab Yaquab or whatever, you know, for those young men who tried to pretend that Tahar was going on the uh, rabbinical calendar and the cycle that it has, uh, we would like to ask, when does the, the cycle ever have two leap years back to back? 
two consecutive leap years. In fact, I'd like to show this clip of Tahar's young followers in Texas back in 2009 pretending that they knew what was going on and pretending that Tahar was, you know, on this uh, cycle of the rabbinic calendar. Watch how, after covering the dates for 2008 and 2009, they try to predict the dates for 2010 and 2011. And notice how they get the dates wrong, predicting that Tahar's calendar would slide back in 2010. All right, now just to prove it, I went out and I got the um, I got the phases of the new moon from the um, I got the phases of the new moon from the, uh, the, the navy. navy. All right. U.S. naval. Uh, Come in and see if we get a shot. Oceanography. All right. Now. This, this was the new moon leading into spring last year, all right? 14 days later, we had the Passover, the night of the, what, what on the Greg, Gregorian calendar they call the 20th, all right? Last year was a leap year, all right? So what, it, what, it, what did the document say happens on a leap year in Hebrew? In the Hebrew calendar, it jumps forth, right? And it's normally 19 days longer, right, than a solar year, right? Right. So. That's that's about give or take 19 days, all right? Because it said about 19 days. Oh, now, hold it steady. This to the 25th, from the 7th to the okay. 25th. Okay. All right. Now, go next year, all right? From the 25th, we on a regular cycle now. God willing, we out of here. But if we have to do the Passover one more year. It's going to be on a regular year, so it's 11 days shorter. Mm -hmm. Is that not 11 days shorter than the 25th? God willing, we out of here, but let's say next year we got to do the Passover. This, from that, is 11 days shorter. Is that not 11 days shorter? Uh, we now come to Tahar's actual transition from 2010 to 2011. As was noted earlier in this video, only part of Tahar's calendar slid back, so his Passover started about a week ago. Uh, on the 17th of March. Now, to answer the question I asked earlier, how could a man who claims to be a prophet and claims to be the only one with the true understanding of, of the scriptures make so many basic errors? Uh, the reason, the answer, is because Tahar isn't what he boasts to be. You know, he's not what he claims to be. We can see that with the calendar. We can see that he's stumbling around in darkness and he's just trying to wing it. And he's been just trying to wing it for quite a few years now. Now, before closing this video, it should be noted that Tahar and his followers sometimes try to justify all these errors by noting that Judges 5.11 employs the phrase, quote, rehearse the righteous acts, end quote. They try to pretend that this passage means they're just rehearsing right now, so they don't have to get anything correct. They're just practicing. They're twisting that passage. First of all, even if we agreed that the word rehearse in that, in, you know, meant it in the modern sense, does anyone really believe that it means that it's okay for a man who claims to be a prophet and the leader of the believers to just give a continuously sloppy and half-hearted attempt at getting the days right? Does anyone really think the, the word rehearse means that Tahar doesn't even have to bother knowing how to count to 12 correctly? The reality is that the contradictions we saw in the various calendars aren't honest mistakes. They're not the honest mistakes of a man trying his hardest or trying his best. Rather, these are the errors of a man who's playing games, a man who is insincere, lacking humility, and who's prideful, and, as I said earlier, who's too lazy to do anything more than just wing it. Furthermore, uh, reaching for Judges 5.11 is a desperation move on their behalf. The verse doesn't say what Tahar thinks it says. They're confused by the 17th century English. Note that in Exodus 17.14, Moses, Moses is ordered by God, is order, excuse me, Moses is ordered to do the following. Write this for a memorial in a book and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua. 1 Samuel 8.21 says Samuel heard the words of the people and rehearsed them in the ears of the Lord. Now, what does that mean, to rehearse something in somebody else's ears? In, in the English of the 17th century, the word rehearse could mean to recount or recite. That's why other translations of Judges 5.11 have recite the righteous acts or recount the righteous acts. So Judges 5.11 doesn't justify the sloppy games Tahar has, Tahar has played with the calendar, nor does it hide the fact that he's dishonest about how much knowledge he has and that he's been trying to just wing it for all these years. He may have fooled some of his followers with that shell game, but we here at Truth After Knowledge saw through the deception. If you'd like more information 
or if you'd like to debate this subject in depth in an uncensored forum, join the Truth After Knowledge forum on Yahoo Groups at groups.yahoo.com slash group slash truth after knowledge. Just because your elders are afraid to take part in the discussions doesn't mean you have to be. Man, but you didn't do no research. You're just willfully ignorant, man.